today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how do we design and model and manufacturing these wonderful devices. We've been very motivated by the, the variety of devices and uh, you know, things that are, seem very real to us, but how do we design them? And so I'd also like to talk about how do we bring these products to market? What's the ecosystem that's needed to bring these products to you and me and your grandmother? So one of the things I was thinking about is they're so diverse, these, these products. I mean, we've got implantable stuff, we've got you know, um, things that you'll see later, spectrometers and, uh, and DNA sequencers. It's just mind-boggling. How, how can we possibly design these things? Well, one of the things that we noticed is that when you analyze a bunch of these things, including this uh, little uh, medical band-aid uh, that has multiple sensors on it, Luckily to me, as an electrical engineer, I saw some familiar things. They contain similar elements, sensing, power, computing, control, communication, and security. So I'm back and I can think about maybe we can all come up with a way to design these things because they kind of look familiar. Although at first glance, I'm overwhelmed with the diversity. But also, when I was thinking about how to design these things, how can I translate from this giant macro world of devices over here, and now we're gonna make these tiny little things. Are they gonna look the same? Do we design them in the same way? Um, you know, is, is it very, very different? Are we gonna take those 16 racks that our speaker from iMac talked about and, and really have the same architecture on a chip? Or are we gonna do something different because we have new building blocks and new technologies? And one of the things that we have to think about when we're going from the macro scale to the micro scale is physics properties are different at the micro scale. So we have to adjust our thinking and the way we implement things and take into account how things are done at the micro scale. But there's also a lot of commonalities with scaling from the, the macro world to the micro world. So we're gonna have to think about as designers both of these issues, the differences and the similarities. So the question I asked, are new products scaled down versions of macro scales, or are they something different? Well, the question remains to be seen, and we'll, we'll see that as we uh, see the future talks this afternoon. So one of the things that's really great, an advantage to us, when we consider um, the technologies that we have, these MEMS and semiconductor chips that we're going to use, um, they're really well suited to designing these types of devices. The gentleman from IMEC showed us that the scale was very appropriate for uh, manipulating life sciences, molecules, and, and uh, other types of uh, devices. But also, very important, is we have enough force and motion to move these things around. So we can make little micro manipulators, as what's shown on your right over there, so we can move cells around, and we can push them around. So we have the force, we have uh, the motion and we have the scale, scale to probe, as we saw earlier today. So I wanna keep, you wanna keep that in mind. And also, we're at the size that's implantable. Really, really important, because now we can put this technology inside the body and be able to sense and communicate out to the outside world what's going on inside. And that's all due to the fact that we have technologies at the right scale with the right force, force and uh, the ability to implant them. So what are other advantages of our technologies uh, besides scale? If you see here, we have um, a Band-Aid uh, that's uh, from um, uh, one of our, our uh, customers. And then also on the right-hand side, we have a disposable pill that you can swallow. It has a camera inside. It's not disposable, but it takes pictures of you, uh, your insides. And the thing that's important about the technology is the cost is appropriate for making these devices, perhaps disposably. Um, they're shock tolerant, so we can, they can withstand going through the human body. Um, the weight is appropriate because we want to make sure that this is something that you can wear around and feel comfortable with. And the performance is there to get the signals that we need out. So all of these are very, very important issues to designers. We have to make sure that we can meet the performance specifications of the products, and these technologies will meet them. And so what else is important about uh, these uh, MEMS sensors and combining them with chips is the integration factor. 
We saw earlier a picture of a, um, from IMEC of a neural probe. Here's one from University of Michigan. And the thing that's really, really important is the noise performance. Because we can put the electronics so close to the sensor, we can get much better noise performance and be able to, to sense more uh, uh, with a higher performance specification. And the other thing that's interesting too is we can combine chips uh, and sensors together quite closely in various ways. So we can have a semiconductor chip, we can have a MEMS together, we can put the MEMS on top of the chip, or we can put two chips together. So we have a variety of ways to be able to get our electronics and our sensors together. And there's various um, uh, advantages to doing a two-chip system. We can go ahead and optimize the ways the sensors are made and the electronics are made separately, or as in, in shown in the neural probe, we can build them out of the same technology and be able to get these performances in, say, noise or integration level. But what about other types of technologies that we need? We need to be able to manipulate uh, uh, molecules and we need to also put fluids on our chips. So we have to have microfluidics, as uh, was uh, shown earlier in the talk from IMEC. So the question is, are these kinds of materials and these kinds of fluids compatible with semiconductors? And the answer is yes. But we may have to combine the semiconductor chips with other types of substrates and other types of materials and bring that together. And that's a design question. When do I choose other materials? When can I use the silicon that I have available to me? So that's something that we have to think about. And uh, as we saw earlier, it's a reality now. We can, we can put together all the pieces that we need for creating these complex microfluidics systems. And to me, as an engineer, I think about, well, when I go and design, I will then be able to take little parts, libraries, something that uh, I can take a, a pump that's been pre-designed or a valve, and I put them together just the way I would put, the, put together transistors and resistors and capacitors on an electronics chip. So the idea is, can we build a design system and can we create a way of designing these types of structures in similar ways to how we design electronics chips today, or do we have to invent a completely different way of doing design? It's a good question. We'll see. Another uh, issue for us in design and manufacturing of these uh, life sciences based uh, systems is we typically see that as we uh, want to put in together systems that go into wearables, we have to combine with possibly flexible hybrid technologies. So we're going to have our chip because it's highly manufacturable, it's proven, it works, but we typically have to integrate it with something else that's flexible so that we can then either put it on the body or wear it on the wrist. So we typically see a, or a, a, a technology that's quite popular now is combining these very highly manufacturable rigid chips onto flexible substrates. And so these are the kinds of products that you're seeing entering the market today. And so now let's talk about some design issues. How do we design these systems? Well, to me, it was a very interesting world because I was an electronics engineer, I understood electronics design, but now this is like electronics plus plus because we've got optical, we have magnetic, we have thermal. I had to get out my physics book and, <laughs> and try to understand how I was going to, to put all these uh, physics together in design. And the other thing that's really, really interesting, if we consider this example here, this is from my colleague Shiva Roy at UC San Francisco. He's designing uh, an implantable artificial kidney. And it turns out that your kidney is just a filter and we can make filters in silicon. So we can filter the blood just the way your, uh, your kidney does. But what are some of the design issues with trying to create a system such as this? Well, we've got multiple length scales because the people that are impl implanting these devices have to think about the atomic level physics of surface chemistries. Because again, as, as the gentleman from IMEC mentioned, these uh, have to be compatible with the human body. But then, if you look at the size of the, uh, the actual uh, kidney, it's probably, you know, the size of a, of a Coca-Cola can. So we've got multiple length scales. We also have multiple time scales. Those of us who are working in the electronics industry are just thinking about nanoseconds, nanoseconds, because electronics are fast. But the, the micro world in microfluidics and some of these other technologies 
is slower. It can work at the scale of seconds or milliseconds. Thermal time constants are typically milliseconds. So we have to be able to design over time scales and simulate over time scales. And I assure you that's a really t difficult problem. And the other thing that we have to worry about in design, as I mentioned, is these multiple coupled physics fields. So we've, we heard today about uh, integrated photonics and uh, mechanical devices. You have to think about the coupling between uh, perhaps a magnetic and electrostatics and, me and mechanical and thermal fields. It's not just thinking about electronics and the, the, uh, how uh, the electrons are flowing. It's all of these fields coupled together. And as I mentioned, uh, surface treatments are important and, and understanding materials are important. As a simulation person, I always go by the philosophy garbage in, garbage out. So if we don't know our material properties and we haven't characterized our materials, we really can't simulate. So it's really important to understand our material properties. The other thing that's really important also, in, if we are going to have successful products, is it's really about the people not necessarily the technology or uh, even the design software. It's about how do you, we bring these people together from different fields and have them talk and exchange information, especially design information, to have a successful product. And one of the issues that we saw was putting together mechanical designers who think that E is Young's modulus with electronics designers who, of course, think that E is the charge on the electron. So we're speaking in different languages and we use different design tools, and, but we have to come together to do design. So one of the, the challenges that we saw was how do we bring these people together and allow them to communicate about the design without making mistakes. And the interesting thing about a new field like life sciences is that a lot of the ways that we do design haven't been invented yet. So we have to come together as a community to solve this problem. So we have to get people uh, speaking the same language. And I don't mean the difference between English and German <laughs> or things like that, but the scientific language that they're expressing their designs in. And so the other challenge is that this is a global uh, economy now. And so people are going to be in different locations when they're doing these designs. So we have different experts, the doctors, the uh, folks that are doing this, the uh, computational fluid dynamics, the electrical engineers, the packaging engineers, all have to come together to make this successful. And I think that a lot of times people don't realize that at any point there could be a problem. The, the prototype may work, but to get it to high volume manufacturing, everyone has to play their role. And speaking of packaging, one of the challenges that we see in using these new technologies is it's not the same as packaging in the semiconductor world. So the, the purpose of packaging in the semiconductor world was to protect the device. The, the smarts were in the device, uh, we got the electronic signals in and we need to protect it. But now in these bio chips, we have to uh, allow part of the device to be open to the environment because that's the point. We're trying to sense the environment. So um, part of the device is open. So for example, uh, in a pressure sensor shown on the right-hand side, we have to have a pressure port. Um, and in our, our kidney, we have to be able to let the blood flow over the chip and out the other end. So we have to protect but allow access. And so um, typically in our field today, packaging is custom. But the question is, if we're going to design in high volume and we're going to design many, many different products, we're going to have to start moving to the idea of what would some standardized packaging look like. But for today, we're, we're going to make our own uh, decisions about packaging and they're all very, very different. And we also see that they're very, very application specific. So a package that we see, say, for a pressure sensor is going to look very different than a package for other, you know, a, a DNA chip, for example. And what about testing? How do we test these devices? In the semiconductor world, we have very, very high speed automatic testing that, I mean, if you go into a semiconductor test world lab, it's amazing. And we can pump those chips through there and test them. But how do we test these biological life science projects? We've got to get these teeny tiny little signals into and on off of our chip. So we have the little chip in the middle and then we have all this stuff around it. 
So the question is, how can we evolve and create a more standard test environment? And so the interesting thing is we have to come up with standards for very specific things like connectors. In the integrated circuit world, connectors are completely standard. I don't have to think about it. I just order one, order a connector. I, I, don't, I, I know someone took care of the standard for that, and I know it's going to connect to my chip. But in the, the microfluidics world, things are not very standard. There's not standards, connections, technologies. So this is something that we're working on, something as simple as what size should the connectors be? And what about fixturing, too? In the IC world, you have an automated, the, the, the uh, wafers never see a human being. It's on the, on the uh, cart, and then out the other end it comes. So in, our, in this, these new biochips world, do we have any sort of standardization for the fixtures or for the, um, the way that we can move the chips from one place to another? And also handling for test. How are we going to, to supply the test signals into these chips? And also, finally, how do we regulate the stimuli? So, for example, we call it in the, uh, in the MEMS world, we call it shaking and baking because we have to, when we test an accelerometer, we have to drop them, we have to, to hit them, we have to do all kinds of things. And uh, this is true in the life sciences world as well. So it's not as simple as the IC testing and the uh, IC handling, but we'll get there. We have to take advantage of the knowledge that we have from the IC world, but modify it to this new life sciences paradigm. And one thing that we have to talk about, I wish we didn't, is security. We have to build in security into these products. And um, this is uh, a uh, well-known example of a um, accelerometer being manipulated by a, uh, a, an ultrasound signal. So they are actually able to change the uh, output of the sensor by spoofing it. And the question is, how can we protect our biochips so that people can't you know, attack them at the sensor level, because the world is changing. Instead of people attacking and doing denial of service attacks on the internet, they're going after our sensors. So we have to make sure that we protect and secure our sensors and these products. And so as I mentioned, the sensors are being attacked directly, and we want to be able to put chip level security and identification features. So this is an additional design complexity, but it's a problem that we have to solve within the ecosystem to help each other out. And so talking about the ecosystem, we had a few slides earlier about what that ecosystem might look like. And the interesting thing now, if we consider the well-ordered semiconductor ecosystem, it's all very clear. There's always a supplier for anything you need in the semiconductor manufacturing process. But in the life sciences area, a lot of this is new. Uh, the, the interesting thing, though, is that uh, because life sciences-based uh, uh, products are starting to become a reality, we're seeing a lot of the equipment vendors getting interested in it and people coming into the ecosystem. So before, a lot of labs would have to, I'm sure I bet IMAC had a lot of custom equipment that they had to build on their own. But now uh, there's a lot of suppliers, hopefully some of the folks in this room, that want to come in and build uh, part of the ecosystem by supplying uh, test equipment, by supplying other types of manufacturing equipment and being part of the ecosystem. And so I think that the interesting thing, though, is that it's still going to be a very diverse ecosystem, a very distributed ecosystem, but it's on its way. Um, I'd say we're, we're still in the uh, wild west of uh, ecosystems where a lot of things are, it's both challenges and opportunity. Not all the pieces are there, but that's a big opportunity to pe for people who want to come in. And let's not forget the users of our systems. Um, one of the things that's really important, we can create these great technologies, but if people can't use them and understand them, then they're not going to be able to deploy them. One of the challenges that we have as chip manufacturers and, and uh, MEMS manufacturers is that our chips work, we test them, we think they're, they're great, and then the users get a hold of them, and they're like, well, I don't know how to use this thing. <laughs> so I think in the semiconductor world, uh, that you know, that transfer to the consumer is pretty straightforward. But in our world, what we have to do is make sure that these chips and products are usable uh, by the average researcher. And so that's one of the interesting things. That, um, this example here was from a woman who was trying to put sensors 
on uh, a, um, a prosthetic that was being used by a gentleman. And uh, one of the things that happened, there's, there was interference from uh, the batteries and some of the other equipment that was being used around it, which kind of threw the sensors off. But the question I ask is, how much does the user need to know about the technology? Or should they just be able to use it right off the shelf? So where are we in that, uh, you know, in, in solving that problem to create um, chips and chip-based systems that people can just use and the average consumer can feel comfortable that they don't need to know that it's a MEMS or a semiconductor inside of it. So with that, I'll leave you. I hope I gave you some things to think about uh, in terms of the design and manufacturing of these devices and bringing them to market. And hopefully um, we'll stimulate some interesting discussions this afternoon. Thank you very much.